It's all yours. Yeah, thanks, Doug. So another presentation on microstructure. Like Doug said, my name's Tony. Uh, I work for Dan Miller in engineering at Montana State University here in town. So microstructure-based modeling of energy release and snow fracture. Uh, before we start with that, I'm just going to go through a few basic concepts, uh, some material science kind of things. Uh, so we're going to start by defining work. Think back to your physics classes. Work is a force applied over a distance, force times distance. Um, work can be converted into energy. Energy is defined as the ability to do work. So work and energy, kind of two sides of the same coin we'll be talking about a lot during this presentation. So that's a picture of a ski. Uh, if I apply a force over a distance to this ski, say I push down on it with my foot, uh, I've applied a force, I've deformed that ski some distance, so I'd say I've done work on that ski. And the work that I've done on that ski gets converted into what we call elastic energy. So there's elastic strain energy stored in the ski because my foot did work on the ski. Uh, stored elastic energy, sometimes it can be recovered. So there's elastic energy stored up in that ski. If I take my foot off, it pops back. So that's a recovery of energy. Um, if we put too much work into a system that energy, the work energy that got put into the system can be dissipated. So that can come out in the form of heat. Um, you can do work to fracture a material to break it into two pieces. So if I do too much work on this ski, if I push down with too much force for too much distance, you might hear a crack and I didn't actually want to break a ski, but <laughs> the thing would break. <laughs> so another real world application of work energy. <laughs> Um, so a mountain biker was coming down a trail at a high rate of speed, so that mountain biker had a lot of kinetic energy. Uh, when they hit the tree, <laughs> did some work on the tree, and that dissipated that kinetic energy. So that kinetic energy that the mountain biker and the bike had uh, went into deformation of the tree, it went into making that tree crack. So as I go through this presentation, think about how work can be converted into energy, energy can do work. Um, because the question that I really want to answer with the research I'm doing is how much energy does it take to fracture the snowpack? Or how much work do I have to put into the snowpack to make it fail? So there are a couple current approaches. Uh, some of you might pay attention to some of the debates. There's the shear model and the anti-crack model. Um, people have been debating which one of these is a better model for modeling fracture in snow. So Dave McClung out of Canada has a shear model. He's been doing this since sometime in the 70s. Um, and he has proposed that there's a shear fracture in a quasi brittle weak layer. Um, and then that's what initiates the failure process in a weak layer in snow. Um, and Dave McClung also says that the collapse, the wump, is a dynamic after effect of the fracture process. So it's not actually part of the failure process. Uh, people were using that model for a long time and people started to ask, well, what about collapse? How do we account for the collapse in the snowpack? So Joaquin Hirely put out his anti-crack model um, almost 10 years ago. Um, and he says, well, let's not count out collapse. Let's say this failure initiates as a mixed mode fracture. So you could be shearing your snowpack or uh, pushing down on it, causing collapse. That could also be part of the fracture process. Um, in fact, could drive the failure process. And if you model different snowpacks using these two different models, you get pretty different answers uh, to my question, which is how much energy does it take to initiate failure in a snowpack? So because we have these two models that give pretty different results, I wanted to come up with a project. And what we're trying to do is analyze this fracture process in the snowpack we're trying to make as few assumptions as we possibly can about these macroscopic processes. So what we're doing is we're not assuming it's a shear fracture through the weak layer. We're not assuming collapse has anything to do with it necessarily. Uh, trying to go back to basics and basically get a third opinion on how the failure process works in snow. Um, so the approach we're doing is we're looking at the microstructure of the snow. Uh, and basically, we're taking small samples of snow, and we're looking at every single grain and every single bond in the snowpack. So instead of taking that macroscopic view, it's shearing, it's collapsing, 
We're saying, what's happening to this bond over here? When's this bond over here gonna fail? Um, and see, as those processes happen, as these bond breakage events occur, what happens? Uh, so I start with a sample of snow. Uh, this is a scanning electron microscope image. If you've never seen snow under an electron microscope, this is kind of what it looks like. So you can pick out, get zoomed in on that. Maybe, there we go. So if you just look at this corner, pretty clearly, there's a grain, there's a grain, there's a bond. We're pretty sure that when snow fails, it's the bonds between the grains that are breaking. Um, so we're taking these really small samples of snow and we're looking at them. And we're assuming that even in a very small sample, you've got the same processes going on that you would have in a larger chunk of snow or that you might have going on in a slope. Um, so just remember, even in an avalanche, a huge avalanche like this, you look really, really closely, it's still just a bunch of bonds and a bunch of grains, and they're breaking apart. So the same processes are in play in a very small sample that I'm looking at, um, and these same processes are going on on a slope scale when you're looking at the entire avalanche. So what do we know? We know that it's documented um, when you're looking at ice, so these grains, snow grains, of course, are just made of ice. Uh, when you're looking at these grains of ice, we know that for a bond, hypothetically a bond that was a square meter, uh, it would take about 0.4 joules of energy to break that into two pieces. So if we take our images of snow, we know how big the bond is, we can predict how much energy it's going to take to break that one bond. And then we look at a sample of snow with a ton of bonds in it and try to figure out how much energy we're putting into breaking all those different bonds. So like I said, we're just taking really small samples, measure the size of every single bond and putting it into a computer model. So we have a micro CT scanner in the lab and Kevin talked about micro CT a little bit, but we get images out of it like this. So this is some surface hoar. Uh, down here, we've got some rounded grains and through these nice big feathery surface hoar crystals on top. So that's the kind of data that, that we have to work with is this really detailed 3D geometry uh, where we can pick out what's a bond, what's a grain, how big are the bonds, when are they gonna break. Uh, so I take some sort of data like that and the 3D snowpack data and I try to recreate it in a numerical model. So basically rebuild the snowpack in a computer measuring the size of each bond and grain um, and then we load the virtual sample in shear. So if you've ever gone out in the field and pulled a shear frame, uh, it's just like doing that, except it's all happening inside a computer processor. And I like to think that when it's running, they go out skiing, but I don't. Um, yeah, and then, so the advantage of the computer model that's really cool is we can measure how much work is done on the sample. Uh, we can actually measure how much strain energy gets dissipated as we're breaking those bonds. Um, and that's something that the technology to do in a physical snow sample doesn't exist. So this is where the model's really useful, is we can see how much energy is dissipated as each bond breaks. And we can also look at where every single bond is breaking in the snowpack. And again, the technology to do that in a lab just doesn't exist. So we get this really up close, detailed view of the snow. So this is kind of an overview of how the modeling process works. I start with a snow sample. Um, some of it goes into numerical modeling. So I take the snow sample, I put it in the CT scanner, and I look how the bonds and grains are arranged. Uh, that goes through a numerical model, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. And then out of that numerical model, I'm looking at the energy release. So the numerical model tells me how much energy gets dissipated when that sample of snow fails. Uh, so that's the model inside. And then down here, I also look at it in the laboratory. So I take a little different chunk of snow, but from the same sample, um, and I do a shear test on it in the lab. Um, and then from there, I do some calculations, and I measure how much energy is released from that snow sample in the laboratory, and then compare the result from the model with the result from the laboratory, and generally they agree pretty well. So that said, I'll talk a little bit more about how the model works. Uh, basically, I take a little sample of snow and I shear it until it fails. Um, 
The downside of the numerical models is they take a lot of computing power. So that cube you're looking at there is a cube of snow. Uh, that base edge is about seven millimeters wide. So I don't know, like that big. Um, it's not very big. Uh, so each different color in that cube is a separate grain of snow that's been segmented out. So you can see there's a lot going on. So there are a lot of grains and a lot of bonds in that sample. <laughs> so believe it or not, that little seven millimeter cube is about all we have the computational capacity to do. Uh, and that's using a pretty fancy computer at MSU. So just to simulate that shear test, the base of the sample is fixed and move the top of the sample. So I have this model where I'm not assuming it's a shear failure, I'm not assuming collapse has anything to do with it, I'm just trying to replicate the natural process or the failure process in snow and see what happens within the microstructure. So here's a little animation, because um, it's kind of hard to interpret, but down here there's a base layer. In here I've got some two millimeter surface hoar crystals um, and then above there, there's a slab. So this is based on an actual sample of snow. We grew surface hoar layer in the lab and then put a slab of snow on top of it. Um, so I sheared it in the lab and then this is the model that I looked at to compare the experiment to the model. Um, so here's the base. We have some rounded grains and then it's kind of hard to see in here. You can kind of tell it's less dense. Uh, you can see it's a little porous. This is the surface hoar layer and then the slab on top. So as we go through this test, um, it shears. But what we notice is the base layer pretty well stays intact, the slab layer pretty well stays intact, and the surface hoar layer is getting deformed, which is exactly what we'd expect. So it's a good visual sanity check. Um, but we know for the most part that deformation, that failure is happening. And here's how some of these experiments compare to the numerical models. So there, are, when you fail a piece of snow, there are a lot of processes going on that I can't always suss out where the energy is being dissipated. Um, the thing to take away from this graph is when the experimental sample fails, it's the energy released is somewhere in here. So it's about 0.1 joules per square meter of energy being released in the experimental sample. Um, and then these black lines represent the model. So x-axis is shear strain, and then this y-axis is how much energy is being released. So ideally, our, our experimental laboratory sample failed here. So we want the model to be up in here somewhere. So dissipate the same amount of energy as the experiment did. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty close. Um, these models never really match up perfectly in snow because we do have so much spatial variation um, in the snowpack. So if you're within a factor, all my results are within a factor of two or three or so of the actual experimental number. Oh, so this is again a confirmation that the model is dissipating about the right amount of energy. And if it's dissipating the right amount of energy, that's a good sign that it's probably doing what I think it's doing. Uh, so the next thing to do is to look into it a little more closely. Oh, let's see. So the other really interesting thing is we were looking at locations of bond failures. And this is something you can't do in an experiment. You don't know which bonds are breaking because the bonds are tiny. Um, but with a numerical model, I'm actually able to track when and where every single bond breaks. So x-axis on these plots is the time within the simulation as the sample is being loaded. And this axis is the coordinate, the z-coordinate of where the bond breaks, so through the height of the sample. And on the left here, I just took a homogeneous sample, rounded grains. I basically put the grains in a box, let them center for a day or two, um, and take a shear frame to them, so no weak layer. Uh, we see this really diffuse failure process. So every blue dot represents a bond that's failed. So we've got bonds failing down low, we've got bonds failing at the top of the sample, we've got bonds failing in the middle. Um, so what we're seeing is that in these homogeneous samples with just rounded grains and no weak layer, there's not really a clear fracture process happening. There are bond failure all over the place, and eventually enough bonds fail, and then the entire sample fails, but there's no clear path that directs the fracture. 
Graph on the right, it's graphing the same concept, but this comes out of a sample where there is a buried layer surface for it. So again, this sample is about seven millimeters tall. Almost all the bonds are breaking right in the middle where that layer of surface for is. So we're concluding from that is that when there is a weak layer in the snowpack, that gives us a, well, it gives a sample a place to direct the fracture so it's more of a clear fracture path. And it looks like they're breaking really quickly too, right? Right, right at the very start. It's they are, yeah. Right um, yeah, so I mean the first tenth of a second or so, everything's failing. And when you look at, if you look at the stress drain plot, it's a, a little bit sharper failure and it's a little bit clearer that it, it ramps up in load and then drops off. With a surface hoar, that happens more clearly with a surface hoar than with these homogeneous samples. So overall results, the big question, how much energy gets dissipated when snow fractures? In homogeneous samples, it really seems like it depends on the sample size. It's really looking like it's this whole volume failure process if all you do is fail a slab of snow. Uh, without a weak layer in it. If you do have a weak layer in the snow that directs the fracture, um, we get about 0.1 to 0.5 joules per square meter. That's the energy required to fracture that weak layer. Uh, that's in line with what's in the literature. It's probably a little bit closer to what's in the shear models and what's in the anti-crack models. Um, in fact, some of the research that's been done with the anti-crack models, they're finding that the taller the slab is, the more energy gets dissipated. Um, and what I think is happening there is we're still dissipating some energy in the slab. Um, and that goes into where the bonds break. When there are weak layers, for the most part, the bonds are breaking within the weak layer. Uh, but there's still some dissipation, still some bond breakage outside that weak layer that I don't think we can entirely count out. Um, and again, that goes back to some of the results that are showing up in the literature where energy release does seem to increase as the slab gets thicker. Um, if there's no weak layer in the snow sample, there's really not like what we would think of as a fracture propagation. It's kind of this random damage process. A lot of bonds break and eventually the sample will fail. Um, but it's very much more a whole volume process if you don't have a weak layer to kind of direct that load. So you look at this and, I mean, part of what this model does, it confirms some things we already know. You need a weak layer and a slab to propagate that fracture, right? We all know that from being out in the field. Um, we're also learning that damage accumulates in both the slab and the weak layer, and I think that damage process, especially in the slab, shouldn't be counted out. Um, and then once enough damage accumulates, the sample will fail. So what I'm taking away from this research is that fracture in avalanches is maybe more of a diffuse process involving more of the snow than we currently think. Um, and if you think about it, this makes a lot of sense, right? We can go out in the field, we can do tap tests, so column test, extended column test. You're hitting the shovel. Every time you tap that shovel, you're breaking a few more bonds in the snowpack until eventually the whole thing goes. So that, I think, really fits in well with this damage accumulation uh, viewpoint for failure in snow. And then, you know, this damage accumulation thing, and really just spitball in here, but it, you know, it may be a way to look at post-control avalanche releases. So you throw a bomb on the slope and it doesn't go, but you've definitely damaged the snowpack. You've broken a lot of bonds in the snowpack. And then maybe it seems stable, maybe some skiers go down, you know, and as you're skiing down, you're damaging a few more bonds within the snowpack. Eventually, you know that unlucky skier just does the right amount of damage to trigger that slide. Um, so I guess the takeaway for this for practitioners, uh, next time you're out in the field, think about the slab and the weak layer as a system and they have to accumulate enough damage to fail. Uh, and there is gonna be damage, there's gonna be bond breakage, there's gonna be failure in both of them. So that's my talk, I'll take questions. post-control release in terms of post-control release, you know, in terms of the explosive causing some element of damage and then the skiers potentially 
triggering that. And the and the problem is is that we use you know as an industry there's so many explosives that get used, mm -hmm. but hardly any post control releases. So how would you explain that? Because you know about ninety percent of like there's something like a hundred thousand charges a year used, and about. 90,000 of those don't trigger avalanches and people go skiing on those slopes. Mm -hmm. And out of those 90,000 slopes, maybe there's one post-control release. You know, so, um, yeah, I'm, I've always figured that, that it, was, it would be hard for a post-control release to be this progressive damage. Mm -hmm. Because after the explosive goes off, then you're going to have sintering after that and whatnot. Sure. And also just because of statistically how small a number actually of, of these slopes goes, you know, it seems like it might be more of a, a location, shot location type of issue. A location, just not hitting the sweet spot. Yeah, sure. And that could be it too. And, you know, I know the post control releases are pretty rare, but I do think, you know, and you mentioned sintering, where it's probably you know, a race between the snowpack is going to heal up versus how much damage can you do to it in that amount of time. So, yeah. It was just a thought. Uh, Kevin? Um, you're modeling the surface floor layer mm -hmm. that you showed. Are you able to account for the directionality of that grain type in your model, or are you changing the process? The directionality, like? Like the crystallographic orientation of surface floor crystals, mm -hmm. all being you know, vertically aligned. Versus all the snow grains around it being more isotropic. Mm -hmm. uh, are you able to build that into the model? Yeah, so I don't account for the like the orthotropic properties in the uh, ice where it might have different properties in one direction of loading than the other. But the bonds between the grains do go in at the direction that they actually exist. So the bonds have a, an orientation but I don't account for the variability of properties with the growth axes. Not, is that what you're asking? You're not asking for crystal orientation as much as are you representing the actual geometry? Yeah. And, and he wants to know if you're representing the actual geometry. Oh, representing the actual geometry, yes. So there's, when the snow, I get the geometry of the snowpack out of the CT scanner, um, and there's a routine that segments it into grains and bonds. So I keep the original area of each bond and the original orientation of each bond, and that goes into the model. Yeah. Almost as a follow-up on what Carl was saying, is it possible to put the sample under stress, break a few bonds, stop, and then look at how the sintering then takes over, and, and you're measuring, you can measure how many bonds break. Mm -hmm. Can you measure how many bonds are forming over time if you're able to stop the fracture before it fails completely? Yeah, so I've always wondered if that kind of fast sintering process happens. Um, and unfortunately, the model just doesn't account for that, any sort of sintering. Is it possible to do, or is it just too fine a line? You know, like putting that stress on it, once it starts to break, like Doug was saying, boom, it breaks pretty much, it breaks. Mm -hmm. Can you partially break it? <laughs> Can I partially break a sample? I think in the lab it would be really tricky to catch, um, but uh, in the model you could certainly partially break a sample. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately the model is just not equipped to yeah. account for sintering. It's really a mechanical model that just looks at failure in the bonds. Yeah. So you looked at the location of bond failures with these homogenous slabs and what looked like relatively homogenous weak layers in mm -hmm. terms of surface floor size. Have you thought about looking at building more of a tapered slab or a weak layer with varying crystal size to see if that bond failure location changes? See if the, like to see if maybe the, the failure location with a weak layer would change depending on the properties of the weak layer? Yeah, or say well, the depth of the slab. You know, you have a deeper part of the slab in one part of your sample versus the other. How would that maybe change your, your failure location? Oh, the depth of the slab. You so how would about the, a bigger sample size than what you're Right, right. <laughs> so I am like maxing out my computational limits right here. Um, yeah, and I'd love to get bigger samples. No, but Tony, you could. You do have the ability to simulate a deeper slab with an overbearer. You can put an overbearer stress. 
Oh, yeah, I could do that. Yeah. So he hasn't done that, but he couldn't. Or a second page. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give him ideas. Don't even do that. I mean, you, this, this idea of bulk failure, you see this when you do an ECT and how many times have you pounded it down and all you did was just pound the snow in it, right? It's the same kind of idea. And we have talked about, if we, we even talked about this yesterday, that when you get that partial failure, what's happening in metamorphism is really important. Wouldn't it be great to put a, a, a thermodynamic metamorphic model together with a mechanical model? It's never been done. It'd be great. Third PhD. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep here a few more years. Right, Tony, thank you very yep. much. Thank you. Super interesting. Thanks.